And I see that Dr. DeGracia has joined us here from St. Louis, I presume? Yes, indeed. Live from St. Louis. If anyone doesn't know, but I think everybody does, this is our wonderful professor of clarinet, uh, Dr. DeGracia, and he's uh, got an hour for us on uh, the wonderful world of clarinet. Um, at atu.edu slash bands, uh, there is a button that says uh, resources for educators. And on that resources for educators button, there is a uh, PDF handout of uh, what Dr. Grazia is going to share with us. Is it the same document that you'll be using to share your screen, Nick? Uh, yes, I'm, I'm only going to be sharing one diagram near the end and there's some other things I'll be sharing from my lab. Okay, so would, would it be good for people to do a split screen of uh, what you put on the website? Yes, I think so. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. You can okay, do that. So I'll pop a link into the chat to okay. that uh, document. And uh, Nick, thanks for joining us. Okay, yeah, it's a pleasure to be here. Thanks, thanks for, for having me. Hi, everybody. Um, first of all, uh, I just want to uh, apologize. My, my title isn't quite as cool and trendy as some of the other ones that I've, that I've seen done in past weeks. Uh, what I, what I uh, wanted to talk about today is one of my sort of pet. Uh, favorite topics, which is the the technique of the clarinet embouchure and the and the sound. Not normally when we think of technique, we think of oh, this is a technical piece, lots of notes and all that kind of thing. That's not really what I what I want to talk about um, today. I've sort of broken up my presentation into two halves. Uh, the first of which is going to be some fairly familiar stuff. I hope uh, to most of you. I I see a number of my former students, clarinet students. Hey guys, and. Uh, I don't want to uh, make this into a, a methods class again for everyone. What I wanted to talk about was just some of the things that are really important in clarinet um, performance from the earliest stages, from beginners up to you know graduate students who are still working on those same problems, which are um, so so critical to the production of a good tone. So I'm going to be many talking about um, tone and, and things like that. And I've divided my presentation into two halves, like I said. The first half is going to be about this topic and specifically why the clarinet is different. And it really is from all the other reed instruments, um, in particular woodwind instruments. Um, and the second half is going to be sort of my experience as a college professor seeing these things and, and dealing with these things. Sort of, I've entitled it um, My View From Here as a college professor. Um, and I wanted in this part to talk about some issues for which I don't have solutions. I don't have magic um, things that, oh, if only you do this, your clarinet section will sound better. That's not what I'm gonna be offering today, I'm sorry. Um, um, what I hope to offer is some thoughts and some things which you may or may not have been aware of um, and some ways of thinking which can perhaps um, help your clarinet sections. Um, the other thing I wanted to, to emphasize is a little bit about my own background. Um, first of all, that those, were the, those of you that don't know me, my last name is Italian, my accent used to be British. Um, so I didn't even grow up in this country with the music education system the way it is in this country, which is a little different from what happens in Europe. I played in a band, of course, through, through school and high school. I was lucky to play in an orchestra as well but every member of the band that I was in was also receiving individual half hour private lessons every single week as part of the, the package, which is a, a gift which I didn't realize I was um, so lucky to, to have growing up. Um, in this country, I come across students, undergrads coming into my studio, some of whom have had lessons every week you know, with a fantastic clarinet teacher or their own band director is a clarinetist and gives them regular lessons. And other students have never had an individual sit next to them and say, hey, you know, you're actually doing this wrong uh, at a close, close quarters um, way of doing things as opposed to in a band context where there's a lot of distance and you're trying to deal with, you know, dozens of kids all at the same time. So, um, yeah, let me, let me just jump right in. I, what I, I like to divide the embouchure, the clarinet embouchure, some of you uh, took my methods class may remember this. I like to divide it into the external clarinet embouchure and the internal clarinet embouchure, both of which are radically different from the other woodwinds. Um, 
I think everybody pretty much who's gone to, through a music ed program, has been uh, teaching for a while, whether you're a woodwind player or not, um, know that the clarinet embouchure requires the firm chin, the flat chin. I think we all know this. It's in all the beginning band books. You know, uh, the flat chin is something that's really important. And this is one of the things that's unique about the clarinet embouchure. We, like, we need the flesh to be stretched. We need the substance underneath the reed to be firm, not dampened, not soft and pillowy and nice and warm and cuddly. Um, which if you do that on a saxophone, our, you know, our close cousin acoustically, at least in terms of the mouthpiece, single reed, that tone's gonna be very bright, it's gonna be harsh, and no, you need to warm that up. If you do that on an oboe, uh, bassoons have sometimes, I've seen flat chains on bassoons, I'm not a double reed expert, but my understanding is that the clarinet, we are the ones that need solid chops of steel in order to get that reed to, to vibrate properly and make a, a resonant tone. So we all know this, um, and I'm gonna come back to this point in, 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 a, in a moment, but if I can let's see if I can share my screen with you just a second. Oh, the host has disabled attendee screen sharing. Hey, Dan. I guess we're not sharing my screen. Okay. Um, I have the wonderful photographs of, of uh, before and after students um, where, where I, maybe I can just demonstrate. I don't know if you can see closely enough. Um, I'll get close to the camera. The typical ineffective clarinet armature, which is easy to produce, often involves this kind of shape. And the ideal clarinet armature, which lets the reed vibrate in its best form, is a very flat and pointed chin. Um, I've always wondered um, why, partly why, why that has to be for the clarinet, the flat chin. Um, surely the reed can vibrate the same way on a saxophone, and I, I don't have an answer to that. I have some theories, which I'll share with you later, um, but that's point number one, the flat chin. We all know and love that, and I'll get back to that. Point number two um, is the amount of mouthpiece that gets taken into the, the, the mouth, um, which is also critical, and I think it's perhaps under, under um, explored in, in clarinet teaching, beginner clarinet teaching. Um, the clarinet mouthpiece is, is different from the saxophone mouthpiece because obviously it's, it's a straight line, it's triangular, which means it, it gets wider very quickly as the student takes in more of the mouthpiece, whereas a saxophone mouthpiece is, is kind of thinner at first. So the tendency for what I think 99.9% .9 of students that I've met, incoming freshmen, and the students that I've seen as I travel around the high school, 99% of them will have not enough mouthpiece. So they're playing with a too small amount of mouthpiece. And there's two reasons why I think students do this. Um, one is, like I said, the, the physical shape of the mouthpiece. As you take in more mouthpiece, the thing just feels bigger. And if you're a young player, your, your face is relatively small, it's gonna be perhaps a little uncomfortable. Um, and the other thing is that if you take the correct amount of mouthpiece, or more probably than most students have, the sound gets bigger, the sound gets more powerful, but it also gets a little bit harder to control. It's a little bit like you're changing from a, you know, a little, a little um, town, a little car to a, to a Porsche racing car. Suddenly you've got power and you need that control. And, and students get uncomfortable if they don't have the internal part of the armature figured out, which is what I want to talk about next. Um, a lot of times I've seen this done, and I'm sure you've seen this too. You know, we say, oh, let's take a piece of paper and we slide it down slide into the, the reed, between the reed and the mouthpiece. And that will tell us where the student needs to have their bottom lip. It's the point where the, the reed and the mouthpiece kind of depart or where they join. And from then, that's where it vibrates and this part is just dead clamped to the, the, the mouthpiece. Um, this is fine. This is conventional wisdom. There's nothing wrong with doing this. It's a little bit unreliable in my humble opinion for two reasons. One is that it's very difficult to translate that point to, to where exactly that the lip is resting on the reed once it's in the student's mouth, especially, of course, if the chin is, is soft. So that's not going to work very well. And the other point, of course, is that really, is it here or is it there? 
because all I did was pull a little harder, and, and, and depending how tight the ligature is, so depending how how thick the paper is, it's, it's not really a very accurate scientific um, test, but it gives you some idea about the the best positioning. My advice to you, as 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 uh, if you wanted to make, if you're not a clarinet player and you're wanting to know about, you know, how much mouthpiece should my clarinet players take in, a little more, basically a little more. If they take in way too much, bad bad things will happen. And that's okay, they, they'll not do that again. However, like I've, I've said, it's perfectly possible, unfortunately, to have the perfect, beautiful amount of mouthpiece and not sound as good as you did five minutes ago when you had not enough mouthpiece in officially. Um, and I'll get back to that point as well. So first of all, I'm just kind of laying out all the, the basic, this basic theory, which I, uh, I hope is familiar to you. If it's not, then great, I hope you learned something too. And then comes the internal part of the embouchure. So the external part, very simplistic tour we just did, you know, flat chin, ideally strong muscles, all the kind of chops of steel thing we talk about with, with clarinet playing. That's all wonderfully visible on the outside. You can see it from 10 feet away. You know, you can say, hey, that, that chin needs to be flat or fix it, please. And you'll find the upper register especially works much better. The internal part of the embouchure is also something that is different from that of all the other reed instruments. Um, and again, no one ever explained to me why that's the case on clarinet. I have, I have theories, which I share with you if you want to ask me later. Um, but we talk a lot of times uh, with saxophone playing and with a double reed playing about opening up. We want the sound to be round. Uh, we, want to, we don't want a small, tight sound. We want opening, opening warm sound. On the clarinet, that's a recipe for disaster. And unfortunately, that's an instinct which I think we all have as, as humans. When we put something in our mouth and blow, there's a tendency to, to want to open the throat and especially the tongue and have an, a large oral cavity, which results in a, in a honky spread flat tone and the upper register will just not happen at all. One of the problems I think in pedagogy is making a distinction um, between a throat and an oral cavity. In my experience, the, the throat itself, the, the thing that you know, joins our neck to our mouth is rarely too tight or too small. A student really has to <coughs> consciously constrict to get bad issues with their throat. But I often find, without exception actually, that the oral cavity itself is too large when playing clarinet. If you That's think interesting. Of interesting, Nick. In the first session, uh, Chip DiStefano said that just a few years ago he found that it's actually impossible to open, it's physically impossible to open the throat. When interesting, we, yeah. And he read it in a Pat Sheridan tuba book, and he'd been saying, open your throat to students for 20 years. Yeah, I think it's a, I think it's just a problem. I'm trying to do something that they can't do. Well, I think it's a, it's a linguistic issue. What do we mean by throat? Because the back of the tongue becomes the throat, you know? This is my throat. If you want to strangle me, you go down here. But the part that controls airflow is way up here. It's the, the back of the tongue sort of becomes the throat. And that part of the back of your mouth is, is yeah. what I think has large implications for tone quality in the woodwind instruments. Right, just fascinating that, that in both hours here, yeah, it's the same idea. Yeah, yeah. Well, and, and Niall told me, I think maybe I stepped away for a moment, uh, that I, I enabled the screen sharing now. I'm sorry. Oh, you did? Great. I always forget I, it, it comes, uh, the default. Yeah, to not allow that. Let me see right. then. I want to just show you, um, here we go. I want to show you. Working. Can you all see this? I hope so. Um, this is a picture that I took of a student, uh, a freshman student of mine last year, a couple of years ago, 2019, last year. Um, and I see this all the time in incoming students where the, the chin is just crumpled up and is not really pulling away. On, you know, she played the clarinet. She got into the Arkansas Tech University uh, music major and she could move around. She played notes. I think she was an all region, very good all region player, maybe all state, I don't remember. Um, and it took a little while, and like I'm going to talk about later, it, a lot of close, interactive, one-on-one -on -one patient um, policing of her embouchure to get her to do something like this with a characteristic curve, um, which allowed her, her tone to have a core 
center, lack of flabbiness, it was less airy, and her upper register, uh, altissimo and all that kind of stuff just, you know, suddenly started working as before, yeah, and things were problematic. Um, so this is, this is the classic, this is the student who hadn't really been told um, about the flat shin, or if she had, it hadn't been hammered home enough, and that's my, one of my points about Adrian. Okay, how do I stop this? Go back to here. Am I back? I hope so. Um, so yes, the internal ombudsman on in the clarinet is is radically different, and it's I think it's a it's a challenge um, if you're a band director and you've got a row of woodwinds, especially if you're not a woodwind player, especially if you're not a clarinet player, to try and get your the tone on these instruments to open and be round and beautiful. That requires a large oral cavity in everyone apart from the clarinet. It's a little bit like our, our unfortunate tuning situation with dynamics. You know, as, as clarinets get quieter, our pitch goes up and everyone else goes flat. We seem to be the opposite of everyone in the, in the group. Um, one of the things which I sometimes do to, to demonstrate the importance of the oral cavity, um, I do this for clarinets uh, in the high schools. And some of you may have seen this, I'm sorry, if you're uh, deja vu. Um, I'm sure you know, as, as you know, the clarinet has different registers. So if I'm playing a low register note with three fingers, that's a C. And if I add my thumb key, I don't go up an octave like a sax, I go up an octave and fifth, so we get a G. And then to get into the altissimo register, I actually open this finger and this little hole behaves acoustically just like a register hole in a different place from the tube. And that gives me the third register note, which is an E. So ideally I could get a hacksaw and chop my clarinet in half and throw half of it away and have this length of pipe and get this note. And then if I add the register key, and then add another register key, I get those three, um, three registers. While I'm doing that, I'm radically changing the internal embouchure, the internal tongue position. In fact, it's perfectly possible with a little practice to play those registers without using the register keys at all. So, you probably can't see this on the screen. I'm sorry, you have to trust me. I'm not pressing the register key at all. That was a G and I'm not gonna do anything with the other fingers here. And that gives me a slightly out of tune um, third register note as, as a result of tongue placement. And this is, these are the kind of things that I deal with a lot, obviously at, at the college level and they're some of the most difficult things um, to teach. However, I think just knowing that fact, knowing that the, the small oral cavity, in other words, a syllable which we would sound more like E rather than R, one of the things I do with, with beginners, young students is put a finger in your mouth, say R, and then say E, and you'll feel your tongue raises to the roof of your mouth. And I think some of these things happen in brass playing as well, um, but in the reeds, in the woodwinds and reeds, this kind of embouchure, internal embouchure is quite unique. If you do that on an oboe, things will sound not pretty at all. How are we doing for time? I'm gonna, um, I didn't really wanna talk about t uh, fingers, like I said, um, in, the, in the handout, it does mention a little bit about young players and just one other reason that clarinets are different from the other woodwinds is that we have medium-sized holes on the instrument, but down here, these are pretty large. And this is the only instrument, the clarinet's the only instrument um, that has holes this large, especially this one, that need to be physically covered by a finger. A hole any bigger than that requires a piece of metal on a pad, like on a saxophone. Um, the bassoon holes are relatively small for the left hand. They get bigger down the bottom and then there's, you're just pressing pads. Um, flutes, especially if it's a closed hole flute, doesn't have a problem with, with sealing anything like that. So uh, it, the sealing of the holes on clarinet is actually a, another problem which often gets confused with, with embouchure issues and kids will squeak and think, oh, you must be doing something wrong with your embouchure. 90% of the time, it's actually a, a sealing issue. Um, so that's one other thing to bear in mind. So let's recap, let's recap, because this is, I want to just kind of take stock for a second before I make some of my main points today. The clarinet embouchure is different. The most important thing about the external embouchure the simplest thing to see is the need, the desperate need for a flat chin. Otherwise, the tone will be horrible and a lot of students just physically can't play the upper register if this is dampening the, the reed's vibration. The same thing applies to the oral cavity. Um, often students will try and open their throat and it ruins absolutely everything and it's vitally important 
and we encourage them to understand that that's, that small syllable, an E sound, produces the high notes and keeps the low notes um, together as well and prevents them from uh, spreading too much. Uh, Nick, before you move forward, uh, Chris has a question in the chat. He said, if you have a student with extremely small hands, yep. are the plateau clarinets an option or just not ever? Uh, plateau, the clarinets that have the sort of the metal, the metal plate, is that what he means? I presume so. Yeah, I haven't seen that. Absolutely, yes, go for it. Yeah. Um, I didn't want to spend too much time with one, one thing that, one way around, one of the problems, this challenge for younger students, um, we often say, I didn't want to talk about this today, but I, I will. We often say for beginners to, to use the, the little pyramid, the little peak of your fingertip as, as the thing that goes into the hole to get the best seal. And so if I press really hard for a second in this way, you'll see a ring on my finger right there around the pyramid, around the, the sort of mountain top peak. Um, which gives you the best seal. Unfortunately, that also gives you very flat finger. And often we get inverted knuckles, which, which um, I see that a lot in my freshmen and some of my seniors. <laughs> um, um, so you get a great seal with fingers that are flat like this because there's a large area arriving on the, on the hole. But in the long term, you know, that may later in life, as their fingers get bigger, they may have to learn to actually play with curved fingertips. Um, my philosophy is that the finger needs to be this shape See this, so it's actually curving down, so the ring will actually be more like there, not on the on the peak. Um, but that requires a little more accuracy and, and slightly larger fingertips. But definitely, it's it's anything that makes the life easier for for younger players. Yeah. So in uh, part B, we're we doing for time. Um, you know, what I really wanted to do today, that was all just a preamble kind of introduction. And I wanted to share with you my experiences of being a clarinet professor here in Arkansas and uh, interacting with band directors and recruiting students and seeing students come into my studios and see how can I help the clarinet community here in the state as a college professor? What advice, what things can I point out that I'm, that I'm seeing that maybe in the millions of things that you do as band directors you're, you're not aware of? Um, and I put here in the handout something which I deeply believe being a band director is a much more difficult job than being a professor, at least being an instrumental professor. I mean, I teach clarinet, I, I teach theory as well, but that's, that's different. Students come to me in my room and I have their full attention for an hour and I can make them play better. Um, if you're a band director at any level, you've got a room full of students and they all play different instruments and you need to know so much about so everything and you're trying to get a performance ready, you're trying to achieve something, um, in other words, a final result. Um, you don't always have the luxury of the individual gradual taking of time in your instructions because that's not the nature of band education, at least um, in this country. So let's kind of do a, a do over now and talk about the embouchure again. Um, the external embouchure, I've, uh, unfortunately, from time to time, in fact, very often when I travel around the high schools, I meet wonderfully, wonderful young players. And I, and I first thing I say to them, hey, you know, who knows about the flat chin and how you have to have the flat chin, it's very important in clarinet playing. And about, often most of the hands will go up. Some of them won't, but what, what's that? Not, no one's told me that. Or I'm sure they were told they just forgot or weren't listening, I don't know. Other times I'll say, yes, I know, I'm supposed to have a flat chin, very good but they don't, they actually are not actually doing that. And I think without exception, um, my freshman incoming students, including the top All-State players, top ones, do not really have the chops that they, they should be having. They're managing to play anyway. Um, they have some degree of, of firmness, of stretchness, of control, um, but it's not actually there. And I, I think one of the reasons is one of those things where saying it and, and actually have the student actually do it is there's a kind of a disconnect there. Um, so I wrote here in the handout, a strong clarinet embouchure requires ideally close policing, which is perhaps only possible in one-on-one -on -one lessons with a nagging kind but strict teachers. I find myself saying this fundamental part of clarinet 
bombardier to my students again and again and again, week after week. And they know it intellectually, just like those high school students did that I, that I visited with. We know this intellectually as teachers, we know it as students, this is what I'm supposed to do, but the body doesn't always do it because um, we're busy doing so many other things. And if you as teachers can just check in a little more often and say, are you actually doing that? I know you know, I know that you know you're supposed to be doing this. Are you really getting a flat chain? Are you having trouble being in tune in your high register? Are you, are you spreading out and you, are you really doing it? Oh yeah, it, it, I promise you it, it, it will help. It's, it's, it's one of the situations where the fundamentals as always are fundamental in school or a college a student. And then the, the amount of math fees, going back to that, I think I, I got ahead of myself already. I wanted to say this, but the idea of the piece of paper in between the read and the mouthpiece telling you how much mouthpiece you should have. Yeah, that's okay. But typically what happens is when you're playing the mouthpiece just slipped out. So I've seen, you know, with, with my students, I spend a lot of time saying, hey, more mouthpiece, please. Oh yeah and the sound gets better. And then five minutes later, they're playing and suddenly the chin gets floppy and there's less mouth. Hey, flat chin, please, more mouthpiece. Oh yeah, uh, my, my students here will know about the pencil. Um, we'll tell you later if you, if you really wanna know. Um, but so my advice here is to just try and get the students to just remember to do these things a little bit more, which add that to your list of 10,000 things you're doing in a rehearsal, uh, maybe in a sectional context. Um, the more mouthpiece is kind of an easy fix, um, even though, like I said, it gets a little dangerous because part two, the internal embouchure suddenly becomes more critical when you have more mouthpiece. And this is something where it's just so difficult. Um, it's inside the mouth. It's not like a violin. It's where you can see the bow moving and, and, and just, but just keep that in your arsenal of, of things to do with the students having issue. If your section sounds flat, if the top notes aren't happening, are they really doing a flat chain? Like for real? Or if they are, do more. Do they have enough mouthpiece? Yes, even more. You know, are you saying E versus that? Yes, even more. I think you'll find that. In my experience, at least as a teacher, just nagging a little bit more on those basics really helps. Unfortunately, and this is where I, um, you know, when I, when I first came, I came to this country to, to study at grad school at the doctoral level. Um, and I learned more about the American education system and, and I'm still, you know, flabbergasted by what you guys do or are planning to do, for those of you that are students here today. Um, and I, I, I sort of come to the conclusion, this is my personal sort of philosophy, my view of, of, of teaching. And I, I, let me share my screen with you one more time. This is something that's the uh, second page of the handout. go. I um, hope you can see this. I think there's a disconnect. I think there really is. A, I mean, I don't know how big these circles are, the overlap between the circles between good pedagogy and fast results. There's a big area in the middle. Let's get this, um, let's get this right because I've seen, um, I was lucky to study with at the graduate level with the, one of the great pedagogues in this country, Howard Klug, who also I've watched him teach high school kids in, in various clinics and things. And I've seen this man have a student come up front and play something and sound pretty bad. And five minutes later, less, three and a half minutes later, the tone is radically improved because he did X, he did Y, and suddenly, boom, there's your fast results and the technique is better. Um, so that can happen. I think it does happen much of the time, but I do think there are some areas on the sides of this chart um, where those two things don't actually overlap. So it's possible for the best pedagogy that you can do um, to actually not produce good results at first. In fact, the tone can get slightly worse. I've had experience with students that they manage to play clarinet um, for, and they sound okay, but perhaps for the wrong reason, they're not quite doing it right. And then I encourage them to get the embouchure to be better and they sound slightly worse. And that's a tough one. That's a tough journey. You have to work through that. And that can only be done in the studio. And then in, in, once they get back into the ensembles and their body goes back to doing the other, th the other thing. And then um, there's also the other side of the chart where we can have fast results, tips and tricks, one quick trick, whatever, right? 
and suddenly that clarinet sounds better, Man, it's for the wrong reason. And there's a couple of things that are, that are just little red flags that I don't know um, quite what that solution is here. A classic one, which I see all the time, this is not actually a bad thing, this is just a thing. And there's some examples. Teaching an altissimo G fingering, this is obviously for high school level where we play altissimo stuff. Um, Artismo G fingering, which is normally way too sharp to use, but sounds just about in tune because the student's armature is not correct. I, I, you know, most students are taught a particular G fingering. Those of you that are interested in details, I think it's like this, which is wildly, wildly sharp. Um, but at least they're not flat. And they, because the armature isn't right, because the chin isn't strong enough, it's there, otherwise they wouldn't be playing that register. Let's be clear, it's doing something, just not enough. The oral cavity is small, very, very good. The throat is not wildly open, but not enough. So the pitch is still a little flat. So they fix it by having a sharp fingering, which is the wrong thing to do long term. But if you're in the middle of a rehearsal, if I'm in rehearsal my clarinet choir, I've got a young student and they're out of tune on the top G, use that fingering, add the psyche, something quick fix, great. And the band goes on. And so that's, that's good for ensembles. It's good if they've got their solo and ensemble performance. They've got, a, you know, the all region audition next week. That's great. But please remember that the basics are the most important things. Um, so the flat chain and the oral cavity. Another example that I put down here is uh, assigning a student to play bass clarinet because they have trouble playing the upper register on the B flat, but they sound great on bass. Bass clarinet is obviously a larger instrument. It's, it's, uh, it requires a slightly larger oral cavity because it's an octave lower. And um, it's still not quite like a saxophone, but it, is, it, it does require a larger oral cavity to an extent. And that's fine. For certain situations, put, your, put a student on bass will make them sound better. But then you need to remember that that student's not gonna get good at, at playing B flat. And if they become the best bass player ever, they've never picked up a B flat clarinet and then they come to me to audition for a music major, then we have a bit of a problem because suddenly they can't really play B-flat clarinet. Um, this is one of the paradoxes of running an ensemble. Um, I experienced this a little bit with my clarinet choir. Like, do I put my best bass player on bass and my best B-flat player in first chair, or do I switch those? You know, I, I'm thinking of experimenting with this in the future. It's just a clarinet choir. It's not the flagship ensemble of the university. Um, let's put my principal clarinet player on bass clarinet, see how she deals. She didn't deal very well, actually. You know, um, if I put one of my best bass players on, on, on E flat, which is like a B flat times a thousand, basically, um, that, doesn't, that doesn't happen. But, and yet, but pedagogically, is that perhaps a better thing to do? Does that lie you know, on, this, on this part of the graph right here, where the results are not fast, Right, this sliver right here. You don't have the printout there, Tyler. Um, so I don't know what the answer is, but but please be aware of it. What I'd like you to take from this talk today is to be aware of these things. Um, unfortunately, I've seen it at least three times in the past few years, uh, auditions, students that come with a bass and they sound okay. Um, their, their B flat playing is just not acceptable and then we can't let like, them into the program. Nick, I'm going to jump in for just a second. These are these are great, great topics and great ideas. And you know, uh, you're being generous about the job of band directors, and and not inaccurate, but being generous. And you know, it's not entirely so very different. You know, I mean, you, what you suggested about switching the players in clarinet ensemble uh, most of the semester, sure, it, maybe that's a really exciting idea. You wouldn't do it to prepare the piece you're going to play at Arkansas Clarinet Day. Exactly. That's and the challenge. We band directors, sometimes, I, and myself, I'm, I'm as bad as anybody. I'm not pointing the fingers at anybody except myself. We, we, we forget sometimes that everything isn't assessment, I think. And, you know, maybe you can take that, that clar bass clarinet specialist, encourage him or her to play B flight clarinet for a concert that isn't as high stakes so to speak. And then when it's time to, to go to assessment, you put people in their best places. This commonly comes up with percussion. We'll have students that are excellent timpanists and excellent snare drummers and excellent mallet players. And w before too long, we can blink and we realize, well, wait, little Jimmy has played snare constantly for three years. If we didn't consciously make sure Jimmy 
didn't play. He's really good at it, but we got to make sure Jimmy plays marimba sometimes. He doesn't want to. Well, we have to make sure he goes over there to do that. And it's timpani time in the same way. When it's when it when this push comes to shove and it's time for our assessment performance, maybe we need Jimmy to play snare drum. Mm -hmm. We need James to play timpani and we need John to play marimba. Uh, but not not always. And perhaps that's a, that's in play here as well with our clarinet sections, that we can think more about rotating them around. But keeping in mind when they do have strong suits, we can put them there for certain times of the year. Yeah, it's also hard for them. I mean, they want to do what they're good at. Right. Um, yeah. But I mean, the, the biggest thing I see really is the, the bass clarinet. Over these past few years, for some reason, it's become more of a problem than yes. I've noticed. I'm glad you brought that up. We didn't discuss this in advance, but yes, we, we've had that issue. And sometimes the students are really disappointed. It's really tough then in March, April of their senior year. I mean, we've had, we've had students come in and, and they want to be contrabass players. Yeah, you know, no. they, they've, they've played nothing but that big instrument for a long time. Yeah. And, and, uh, and that's tough. I saw in the in the chat some people are asking about the pencil. We'll get to it in a minute. If you yeah, want. your students have teed it up like it's this really exciting thing. Yeah, it kind of <laughs> I'll show you in a minute. Let me finish. Let me finish my thing. Uh, what's another kind of oh another sort of quick fix that is scary for me as, a, as a, when I see it happen is the choice of reads. Having a student, and I did this. I, I I'm sure I did this when I was you know 16 years old. Putting a student on a heavier read on a harder read than they should be on because they either, again, don't have enough mouthpiece. Think about it, if you take a tiny amount of mouthpiece, the amount of leverage you have, you have more leverage. So any squeezing, any biting, you're gonna choke off that reed immediately. If you're down here, there's more strength to the reed and there's more leverage. So any squeezing has less effect. So if you're a biter, if you're biting, number one, if you're biting, you can put a heavier reed on and that will kind of solve the problem for the wrong reason. Or B, if you don't have enough mouthpiece and you're choking off your sound, what you should do is take more mouthpiece. But instead, sometimes students are given a heavier read or the student themselves will say, oh, I, I sound more comfortable. I feel more comfortable when I play a three and a half or four or four and a half. I used to play on the four and a halves when I was 18. It was kind of a macho thing. Oh, cow, you know. And actually, I was just biting. And when it's a very strong read, because it's so resistant to a bite, it gives you a, a safety net, kind of a cushion, because you can bite and it won't choke off. But your sound is small, it's airy, it's, it's horrible. Um, and a softer reed it, with a good embouchure will resonate better. On the other hand, too soft a reed is bright and buzzy, and of course, so we, we need to get it right. But that's just one example of, you know, quick fix that produces results that are not long-term um, helpful. So um, I want to leave some time for questions. Um, I put in my conclusion here, both the students and teachers, we need results, right? Not just for context, contest or for all, all, all state auditions or whatever, but we just want to play better. We want to sound better. If something does it immediately, that must be the right answer. And it usually is. This area is big in the middle. I'm not for a moment saying that it isn't. I'm just, con I've, the past few years I've been concerned about the edges just a little bit. I've noticed some things, so this is why I'm, I'm here today, I guess. Um, so sometimes we gotta do whatever works, but be aware, be aware of the long game as well. And I think, um, especially if you introduce the right things early on, the, the long game starts from, from middle school and ends at graduation in from tech. Shall I talk about the pencil? Maybe I think we better. I think there might be a riot. This is something I, I learned this from Howard Kluge. And it goes back to one of my one of my experiences of teaching, like I said before, is that the students think this is about the flat chin. The teacher, you guys, and the students ideally will know that they're supposed to have a flat chin. And they'll put the clarinet in the mouth. If they have, if no one's been checking that for the past four years of high school, then they may not really be doing it. And their body, their muscles, their, their you know, instinct brain, their reptile brain, whatever, will, will not do the correct embouchure. And you can say, keep your chin, keep your chin tall. And maybe if they really concentrate, it will get better. But then they start playing the etude. And they got the notes and the sharps and the flats and the left to right pinkies and all the stuff. And so what I've, what I've discovered is the most effective thing as a clarinet teacher 
which I don't think you can do as a band director, maybe with a very long pencil. Um, as the student is playing with a pencil, usually I use the eraser end of it, uh, not always. If the tin gets flat, I'll just reach over to the student and I'll just tap, tap and rub. And that physical sensation in the chin area where that, where that muscle is helps, helps the brain remember, oh yeah, this is what I need to do. And the muscles will, and they'll start to do it more and more. Um, so there's sort of a feedback, a tactile feedback for the student that actually pressing them, pressing with the, with the, with the pencil helps the brain to remember, oh yeah, I'm supposed to do this. And eventually, I see Melissa smiling at me, it becomes like a Pavlov response because I'll be sitting in my studio and I'll notice the tone gets a little airy, gets a little flabby up top, and, flat, and I see the chin is not, not as firm as it should be and I'll reach for a pencil on my desk and the, the embouchure gets better and I can put the pencil back. Yeah. Melissa may have been smiling about that or just like I was smiling about the notion of Sergeant Blasdell is very traumatized by the pencil, he says. Oh, yeah, I wasn't reading the chats while talking. Yeah, everybody's uh, poor Sergeant, tough guy, Blasdell. I guess you yeah. traumatized him. Yeah. But you know, it's, it's fun, but it, it's actually hard. I've had some students that you say, I, I do this flat chain thing and they get it. And the next week it's already better. Um, and I had one student, um, um, Elisha, whose picture I just had up on the screen a while ago, um, getting a sunbeam in my camera. Um, she, we struggled for the longest time using a mirror and the pencil and the brain. She just wouldn't, it wouldn't do it. She spent so many years doing it kind of wrong or very wrong in her case, that it was a long struggle. And this is, like I said before, the, the luxury of a private lesson. Well, and Tina made a good point earlier in the chat about uh, mirrors so students can see really what they're doing. And I wonder even these days with, I mean, they're all carrying phones. Yep. And, and ask them if, if they loan the phone and videotape just a little bit, you know, videotape, uh, digitally record a, a bit, take pictures so that we could all see, see that would be, I think, terrific too. Um, we had a question about general guidelines for moving to harder reads for students. I th think the group might like to hear if you have some do's or don'ts about any equipment. Yes, yeah, so I had a little thing about the equipment. Know, pieces, pieces, beginner instruments that you have some experience with, mid-level move-ups. Yeah, yeah. Um, my biggest piece of advice um, is that pick equipment that is average. There's a whole plethora of clarinet mouthpieces that, that are out there, and they all have different dimensions. Um, I'm not going to go into the, all the, the technical reasons for that, but basically, some mouthpieces have a, a wider tip than others, and some mouthpieces have a, a longer facing. In other words, and with some mouthpieces, I'll slide the paper down and it will stop right there. And others, it will go all the way down because the, the curvature is different. So my mouthpiece is actually quite a long facing. The paper goes quite a way down before it stops. Um, and that's the thing. The, the clarinet reed and the mouthpiece are a pair of objects. So you can, depending on the shape of the mouthpiece, a two and a half reed can feel like a four or a one and a half, the same reed on a different mouthpiece because of the, the mount it has to bend in order to vibrate. So my biggest piece of advice is pick average, average uh, mouthpieces. And the typical one everyone has, um, if you can afford it, is the 5RV Lyre Van Doren. Um, I grew up on that and still used. Um, it's average tip, average, curvature, average facing, don't go anything different. Because then what happens is if kids all have different mouthpieces and they all have the same read, they have a radically different experience. Some people will be fighting a too heavy setup, others will have too light a setup. Um, when, to, when to move up. This is, a, this, you know, we talk about moving, moving up as if it's a, a ladder of achievement. There are, in other countries, England, not so much now. Um, I should, I don't want to get digress what time is it. Um, in the 1970s, probably 60s, 1970s, there was a school of English clarinet playing, a lot of famous clarinet players, one guy called Jack Brimer with the London Symphony Orchestra, who had a very different way of playing clarinet, a lot of vibrato. Um, we don't do that anymore nowadays. But the old British school of clarinet playing, they used to use very soft reeds. Professional, top level professional players would be playing on two, maybe a two and a half. Um, with a great embouchure so that you can control that and the sound is, is delicate and it's free and they can do all sorts of things. 
Um, so this, and, and then you go to uh, some kind of uh, other schools are playing in Germany, Austria, where they have a lot of resistance, the Erler system, clarinet, you hear that in the Vienna Philharmonic. Those guys, they're, they're blowing like oboes, basically. Um, so there are, there's not a ladder of achievement, like I said before, like a two and a half is for babies, a one and a half is for beginners, and a two is if you're okay. And as you get better, you get to a three. Oh, if you have a three and a half, you must be a really good player. It just doesn't work like that. If the reed is too soft, it will be bright and it will close up more easily. But if a reed is closing up, it's probably because the kid is biting it. I mean, if I have a reed which is really old and really soft, it'll take a little more mouthpiece. Biting it or not taking enough mouthpiece. Yeah. So um, I don't have a simple solution um, to that, simple answer to that question about reeds. You know, I'll toss out there, everybody. I, I mean, I say all the time, I think the clarinet section is the most significant section in the wind band in the symphonic band. Uh, if you have a strong clarinet section, a lot of repertoire is open to you as a concert band. If you don't, tons of repertoire is not available to you. I, I mean, Jim and I are trombone players, but we have to admit you can get around with a pretty average trombone section with really advanced repertoire. And you just can't with the clarinet. It's the most significant section in the wind band. Well, the, you if know. I were here, let me, just, let me just toss this out there. I don't mean to, to take your time, Nick, but um, take advantage of, of Dr. Dobrowski, not to, not to say it kind of indelicately like that, but when it comes to equipment, it, you know, invite him into your band room to look at your equipment. And when you get a few dollars from the administration, you can buy some things. Don't do it without taking advantage of, of asking him to look at what you've got and what you're trying to do. And, and you'll be more efficient with the way you spend your money and you'll get better equipment, I'm sure of it. Mm -hmm. There's something to be said for uh, plastic reeds as well. Um, they're not bad nowadays. The new plastic reeds, they're, they're expensive. But if you, if you get the right strength that matches the mouthpiece, at least you have a known quantity um, it's not going to change. I mean, they, eventually they go bad, but if you, everyone, if you want your clarinet section to have the same equipment that feels the same and, and it's going to be steady for weeks at a time, then a plastic reed is not a bad idea. It's not like, oh my gosh, it's plastic, it's going to sound plasticky. The same thing applies to clarinet, by the way. I've had so many times I've had parents or people say to me, oh, my, my you know, my, we found my grandfather's clarinet in the attic and it's wood. Uh, it must be better than the plastic one. My kid is playing a band right now, so he's going to progress onto this wood clarinet. And of course, it's, first of all, it's wood, so it's been in the attic for 20 years, and it's just it's warped and it's not good anymore. And plastic clarinets are perfectly fine. Um, the, the tone is like 0.1% not as good as a wooden clarinet. And much of that is to, well, okay, 10%. Sorry, I'm exaggerating. 10%, 15, I don't know. But part of that is just the manufacturing accuracy. You know, if the clarinet is working properly, people always ask me, what kind of clarinet should my kid have? One that works. The pad seal and the mouthpiece is not chipped, got a chunk taken out of it, or it just works. The rest is up to them. The rest is about the flat tin and the embouchure, trust me. Yeah, just remember, in the Amazon world, we need to be a little more specific than that because we also want it to be something that can get serviced at a at a dealer local and you know you can well, i'm just trying to make the distinction between wood and plastic I of course, of plastic course. i know from some of our people that are here you know they they deal with the kid coming in they got a green clarinet it's a brand nobody ever heard of because well those those made in china plastic clarinets that you get for 100 bucks that's right the trouble with those is that they're made but it's not because they're plastic right they, their holes are not drilled accurately right they're out of tune and the hole itself is not smooth so it leaks when you put a pan on it Right, which means that they go in the category of does not work. Yes, that's what not because it's plastic. Right, right. Yeah. Okay, everybody. Any, any other questions? Yeah, Caitlin, never buy an instrument from the same place you can buy toilet paper. That's a good point. Yeah, right. That's right. Unless Cooper Junior starts selling toilet paper, I suppose. But well, I hope that was helpful. Um, like I said, it's it's not a solution. It's more a presentation of some problems. Maybe you didn't know they were there. Well, it's just that's 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 music education. There there aren't there aren't quick fixes. This it's a long term process. Why it takes a lifetime to be a musician. And um, would you uh, mind, Nick? Would you put your email address yep. in uh, the chat so these folks can stay in, in touch with you? And look at that. Did I call it? 
Dr. Del Grazia, or did I call it? Mr. Brody would like to know your favorite orchestral clarinetist. Oh, seriously? Yes. Oh, my favorite orchestral clarinetist? Oh, no. Ralph. I mean, wait a minute. How do I send this? Press enter. Okay. I believe so. Did everyone get my, my email? Not yet. Um, uh, that's an impossible question, Ralph. My favorite clarinetist overall. It's, I mean, favorite orchestra. I know there was there's a woman called um, uh, in the Los Angeles film who plays a German system clarinet. Um, gosh, I can't mind her name escapes me. And that wow, what a great sound for an orchestra. Maybe when she stands next to me, I wouldn't like that sound. Um, Ricardo Morales is a beautiful player in an orchestra. He's a little boring when he plays solo chamber music. Here in the St. Louis Symphony, you know, Scott Andrews, I know him, he's an amazing player, so. Um, yeah. We didn't get your email address somehow. It didn't work, let me type it again. Hey Nick, when you're done, there was a question about, um, do you have any specific exercises that help with flattening the chin that band directors can do? Oh, I think I just, hold on, I think I just sent it to one person. Hi, Lindsay. I need to send it to everyone. Here we go. Got it. Uh, what was the question? Exercises yeah. to flatten the chin. Right. Yeah, like something a band director can do in rehearsal or a real quick one-on-one. -on -one. Well, I mean, some people just are, aren't very good at it. It's just doing it without, without a clarinet. Like, just literally putting a finger on your lip and, and what, I, what, I, what I discovered is most helpful is to put a finger on your lip and press it against your teeth and then, these are my, and then slide your lip out. So your finger ends up touching your teeth. So you start here and then you go. You see that? So that's an exercise in actually pulling those muscles down. That's the only thing that I've really come up with. Some people can do that just like that. Other, other people just, their body won't do that for the longest time. And the important thing is also to, for the, the ear to make the connection between when I make this face, my sound gets better. Once that connection is made, then the body will start to do that automatically. Um, at first, it's an act of faith. So Nick, when you do that, do you just start on long tones and just practice that using long tones? Yeah. Yeah, take everything else out of the equation so you're not thinking about And what unfortunately happens is that they, sometimes during the process, a student can make a great sound on a long tone and then they go back to the piece they're playing and of course their brain's now concentrating on the 25 other things and so the face goes back to normal. And that's okay too because and then they go to the, you know, the band rehearsal and they're concentrating on the conductor and sound of course the body will default to what it was doing before but if every time they practice they do some of this you get like a percentage 90% bad 10% good during each day and eventually you'll get to a point where they can actually do this embouchure and play. Uh, that student whose picture I put up just earlier, Alicia, she came to me one day and said, my gosh, I, I, I just realized I sat through a whole band rehearsal and, and I was thinking about my chin, I did it the whole way through. And that was a big achievement for her, so. Yeah. Okay, everybody, if that's it, no other questions from Dr. Del Grazia. Niall says hi to Jennifer there, Nick. So I'll, t I'll pass it on. You made a little cameo behind your left shoulder there a moment ago. Oh. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Uh, she doesn't. She didn't mean to. She just walked by. Uh, but thanks for taking the time to do this. Very My pleasure. Hope it was helpful. Uh, everybody, next week is uh, let's see. Our two hours. Our first hour is uh, the infamous Dr. Magnuson, uh, my friend and colleague, composer and uh, theory pedagogue extraordinaire. He's going to talk about uh, music theory pedagogy for those of us with an AP theory class and uh, for those of us that don't. Uh, ideas and ways to integrate some theory into the traditional band rehearsal. Uh, and in the second hour, Gretchen Renshaw James is going to join us and, and do a tuba masterclass and, and discussion next Tuesday night. So if nothing else, thanks everybody. Stay safe. Uh, keep your fingers crossed. Hey, oh, uh, news uh, that's coming across the uh, social media platforms and, and Robert Ambrose actually just texted me about an hour ago. He's the chair of the COVID-19 committee for the CBDNA. Our uh, studies that the CBDNA led about aerosoling and wind instruments from the University of Colorado and Colorado State, uh, we just got word we're going to get the data Monday afternoon. So I know many of your administrators are trying to make decisions, so of ours, uh, so our, ours, you might share with them 
that we should have some real scientific peer reviewed studies uh, Monday afternoon, and then hopefully we can use that information to make plans for uh, what happens next. Thanks everybody. Have a terrific afternoon.